This episode is brought to you in part by audiobook narrator Mike Scott. When selecting your next audiobook, choose from some of the great titles narrated by audiobook narrator Mike Scott, like Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. And if you're an author or publisher interested in having your written works produced as audiobooks, give Mike a shout at MikeScottVoice.com. Mike Scott the voice of history. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass' birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house and have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your visit. Check them out at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options and their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order. That's 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue across from the Dobbin House or RaggedEdgeRC.com. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And today we are talking about the 151st Pennsylvania, the school teacher regiment. The so-called school teacher regiment. We'll find out why in just a bit. Joining us today is Jim Pangburn, a uh, a favorite here on addressing Gettysburg. Yes, of course, Mike. You can clap. That's good. That's good. Thank you. And um, Jim, how you been? Not bad. Good. Good. How's your summer been? Hot. It's moving along. Yeah. It's yeah. The along. heat's been rough. Trying to get used to the closure of Little Round Top. That's kind of weird. What do you What do you do? Because uh, every guide has a different way of working around that. How do you uh, work around that? Well, um, I've been going down to Crawford Avenue since that's open and going around Devil's Den and going through the wheat field. Yeah. And of course, now you know if it's a two hour tour, we can um, you know get Culp's Hill involved or Peace Light. I used to not go to the Peace Light too much because when you go to that northern end of the battlefield, you know you got to go to the southern right. end of the round top, and you get way behind. Yeah. Well, now it's not an issue. Right. Now you can go up to the Peace Light. So, Little Round Top. Uh, is it true that when when it was open that that would eat up a lot of the time because people want to get out and look at the view and take pictures and all that stuff, right? At least twenty minutes right. out of your tour. Yeah, that's a long time. You know, and if you're running late and you know you got to go to Little Round Top, then you're really in the hole. You need like. 20 minutes probably with a bus to get back to yeah, end your tour. Right. A car tour, you might be able to do a little bit faster. You don't have to load so many people. So this, sh- this should be easy for the next 18 months to two years um, for guides uh, getting back on time, at least, because there's no little round top. I would think so. <laughs> you would hope so. Yeah, you'd hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, today we're talking about a unit that it wasn't on little round top. Nothing to do with Little Round Top. Uh, they're out on the first day's battlefield. Um, they're the 151st, as I said before. Jim, give us a little background on the uh, 151st Pennsylvania. Well, Matt, as you said, they're known as the School Teachers Regiment. Um, uh, there's a guy named Harrison Allen that was in command uh, leading up to Gettysburg, but um, uh, George McFarland uh, commanded here at Gettysburg. I think Allen took ill. Um, but McFarland was a school teacher in central Pennsylvania, and he ran like three schools for boys um, in some small towns uh, in Juniata and Snyder counties, mm-hmm. Freeburg, McAllisterville, and Richfield. Um, he must have been pretty impressive to his students because many of them followed him into the education career field and became teachers. Wow. And when he started to raise men to fill the ranks of the 151st Pennsylvania, um, he looked to many of his former students now, teachers. And uh, Mike Lentz and I were just talking about, um, before the uh, podcast, about the number of school teachers that made up the regiment. The fact of the matter is most of the guys in the regiment, uh, like most regiments, were farmers. Right. But uh, I've read anywhere from 60 to 122 guys. Mike saw 113 uh, were, were school teachers. And there were 467 men in the unit, which is pretty high. 
a right. pretty it's large a big structure. unit, yeah. One of the biggest ones you'll find. Sure. So in any case, there's a, a, a large percentage, well over 10% and probably close to 20% or so um, our school teachers are making up the regiment. Yeah, I think the 113 comes from Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, right, Mike? Um, and uh, he gives that he gives that number in his speech. But where the other numbers come from, if we don't trust his 113, what's with the discrepancy? Um, I don't know where I got to 122. I heard that someplace, and I've been using that. But um, the 60 uh, I got out of... Uh, the uh, regimental history in the 105th first Pennsylvania, which is written by a, a friend of mine by the name of Mike Drees. Um, Mike got a hold of um, Colonel McFarland, McFarland's diary out of the Juniata uh, County Historical Society. Well, no, he got a hold of the diary and then he published a book called An Imperishable Fame. Okay. Um, that's what George McFarland, the Colonel of the Unit, said about the unit after Gettysburg. And um, so Mike wrote a uh, regimental history. Uh, he, he wrote a, a book about George McFarland and getting the information on McFarland. He got a lot of information on the unit and he realized no one had written a regimental history on the 151st Pennsylvania. So Mike wrote uh, the 151st Pennsylvania volunteers at Gettysburg, like ripe apples in a storm is the subtitle. Mike told me that wanted to, he wanted that to be the title. Yeah. Uh, like ripe apples in a storm. That was a description of one of the guys describing what it was like to watch his colleagues fall around him uh. at the uh, Herbst Woods on July 1st, west of the seminary. Uh, but his publisher, uh, McFarland Publishing, of all things, uh, in Jefferson, North Carolina. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? Yeah. Um, and the publishers from North Carolina, and that's who they were fighting, North Carolina. But they said, Mike, if you want to sell a book about Gettysburg, you got to get the title, you got to get the unit in there. That's what will get people's attention. So he had to title the book 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers at Gettysburg. But the subtitle is like ripe apples. They should have flipped it. I agree. Make the subtitle the title and the title the subtitle. But the Publishers wanted it. Yeah. The well, hey, man, if they're putting up the dough, you do what they say. Yeah, that's right. So um, they are in uh, Biddle's Brigade, correct? Or Rowley's Brigade? Uh, Doubleday's 3rd Division. Mm -hmm. uh, when Doubleday takes command after Reynolds gets killed, the 1st Corps, Rowley moves up from uh, uh, Brigade to Division Command, 3rd Division, the 1st Corps. And then uh, Chapman Biddle takes command of the uh, brigade, right. which consisted of the 80th, 80th New York, which was also known as the 20th State Militia, 121st Pennsylvania. And the 142nd Pennsylvania and the 150th. And the 151st. 151st, when they arrive on the field, uh, is put in reserve. Right. Initially. Right. Um, and so when Biddle's brigade gets into the action, they're not part of it. Correct? Um, they, they, initially. They were kind of at first, and then there was a lot of maneuvering going on. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things about the 151st is the way they arrived in the battlefield. You know, most of the first corps came with Reynolds up the Emmitsburg Road. Right. But if you know where Merch Tavern is, south of Gettysburg, near where the Route 15 bypass oh, the meets the Emmitsburg yeah, Road. Yeah, right. Yeah. Where Reynolds spent his last night. Mm -hmm. Right there, there's a road that veers off toward Fairfield. It's called the Bullfrog, Bullfrog Road. You're probably familiar with that. Oh, yeah. And they were sent up that road basically because they were worried about Confederates threatening the Union left flank as Reynolds' men moved up the Emmitsburg Road. So they moved out toward Fairfield to kind of protect the left. Mm -hmm. And they went up the Bullfrog Road quite a ways, and some of them kind of veered off toward uh, Francis Cunningham Farm. But a lot of them ended up on what we now know as Millerstown or Pumping Station Road, the, yep. the extension of the Wheatfield Road. And they ended up crossing the Saks Bridge and then reconnecting with the Millerstown Road. And then they went up Black Horse Tavern Road. Um, okay. And then they went out on the Willoughby Run Road, kind of yeah. like Longstreet's countermarch. Right, <laughs> right. Then they came out on um, the Fairfield Road. So um, they kind of entered the battlefield off Fairfield Road, the Hagerstown Road, um, kind of where that shopping center used to be that's kind of now defunct uh, out there where the— uh, Oh, where the pizza place is? No, not that oh, far. Oh, oh where the, no, where the, this is just right where Reynolds Avenue uh, leaves Fairfield Road. Where Tom Road. and Jerry's used to be, the, the gas Tom station. Tom and Jerry's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And they're kind of coming north, you know, facing fire coming from uh, uh, the Herbst Woods area. And then the unit kind of turns to face uh, Heath's division coming from the west. And uh, 151st uh, is put in reserve uh, right in front of the uh, Schmucker Hall at the center. Oh, okay. So... Um, while the fighting's going on, I guess we should get what happens to Biddle's Brigade. We did an episode last year on Biddle's Brigade, so you don't need to get too deep into it. But just to lead into the uh, 151st getting involved, Biddle's Brigade's getting into a uh, pretty nice little uh, scrape there, scrap. And uh, what's going on with them? 
Well, you know about Meredith's Iron Brigade yes. going into the Herps Woods. Uh, basically, what Biddle does is he moves to their left along what we call today East McPherson Ridge and supports the flank there. Because right. the North Carolinians uh, who are coming from the west are extending from the uh, uh, Chambersburg Pike really uh, all the way to the uh, Fairfield Road and eventually beyond that. And so uh, Meredith's guys would have gotten pretty severely flanked on their left, and Biddle comes in and kind of protects that. Right. Kind of takes on the 47th North Carolina and another North Carolina unit um, that are extending almost to the Fairfield Road. Now, he is, it, when it's all said and done on July 1st, is he going to be, Biddle's brigade, is that going to be the uh, southernmost or leftmost regiment in uh, the Union line? Yeah, until um, Buford's cavalry. Right. When the infantry arrives, they do what cavalry normally does. They go over and, and protect the flank. Yeah. So Buford's guys are kind of along uh, where West Confederate Avenue is, kind of near the um, where the Schultz house is today and the uh, the old armory and along that stone wall on the right side of the road. Um, they're protecting the far left. But Biddle's brigade, in terms of infantry, really was the left. Yeah. I said I said regiment, but I meant brigade. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So so. Um, so the Iron Brigade, as you mentioned, is in McPherson's Woods. Biddle's com- Biddle comes in and extends the line a little further south there. And for a while, they're they're getting into it with the Confederates. But there's more Confederates, and they're uh, overlapping. They're flanking uh, Biddle's Brigade. No one is coming to Biddle's left flank's rescue, correct? Um, not that I'm aware. No, I mean, except for except for Buford out on the on the flank yeah, there later he's on. Yeah, you know, further back a little bit. Right. So it's not like he's right on Biddle's left or anything like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So the the 151st though, when they get sent in, who pulls them out of reserve? Was it, I think it was double day ordered someone. I want to say. Originally, they were in the line of Biddle's brigade. Right. And Robinson's division, the second division of first corps comes in and Paul's brigade or Paul's. Uh, yeah. Paul's brigade of Robinson's division begins to form a barricade in front of the seminary building, kind of the rear, like mm-hmm. in a reserve position. But then Robinson was sent to the north along Sheeds Woods up toward Oak Hill. And then the 151st eventually was sent back and they occupied the barricade um, that uh, uh, Baxter, Paul's brigade was occupying. And kind of took their place in reserve once Robinson moved to the north. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then they get pulled out of reserve, though, eventually, because things are getting a little rough. Yeah, uh, but it was later in the fight. Yeah. It wasn't until about 3 o'clock. Um, the other uh, regiments in Biddle's Brigade were up on East McPherson Ridge. Up there where you see all the monuments today, uh-huh. the Cross Monument, 142nd, yeah. and all those monuments, that's pretty much Biddle's Brigade. Yeah. And they were supported by Cooper's Battery. Um and the 151st is kind of to the right and to the rear, and it's it's when the Iron Brigade is starting to get pushed back and flanked uh, that the 151st is sent forward. So that, around yeah. three o'clock in the afternoon, so, so they're pretty late. So the Iron Brigade's having a hard time. They've been fighting since the morning. Um, this is now we're, the lull has passed, and now we're into the afternoon fight. Um, and uh, they're starting to have trouble, and the 151st is ordered to go in because there's a gap between Biddle's Brigade and the Iron Brigade, correct? That's exactly right. Right. So they're going in to fill that gap. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty much the su- southeastern edge of the Herbst Woods. Yeah. And I was just reading that about half the unit supposedly actually extended uh, uh, into the open area. Uh, today you can see their flank marker along Stone Avenue, Murdoch Avenue. Uh, but according to uh, what Mike Dries said, uh, half the unit was in the open, half was uh, in the Herbst Woods. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, and so, but the uh, the two brigades on either side of them, their own brigade and the Iron Brigade, uh, see them coming up, and they interpret that as not an addition to the line, but relief. Correct. Um. I'm not really sure, to be honest with you, oh, Okay. on that. I'm really not sure. I just know the Iron Brigade is is pulling back. The 19th Indiana's on the left flank. They're kind of being flanked. And the 151st comes in and kind of uh, starts to fire into the North Carolinians to relieve the Iron Brigade and help them withdraw. Okay. Um, in in uh, Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, McFarland says that, uh, now this could be him throwing shade, but um, he says that they the Iron Brigade, at least, thought that they were their relief and they started to withdraw. Um, and I think I read that somewhere. It might have been here and in Brigades of Gettysburg, too. But, okay. So, either way. I'll take his word for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so now they're kind of out there all on their own. Yeah, they were actually, at the end of the fight, 
when all the Union forces retreat back to Seminary Ridge, where the seminary is, um, the, the last units were the 151st Regiment and Stone's Brigade. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is pulled back to the seminary at that point. Right. And so Stone's, kind of on their own. Stone's Brigade's over on the uh, uh, Chambersburg Pike, right? To the right or to the north of the 151st. <laughs> right. Okay. So the and, but then there's a big gap her- though to the, till you get to the 151st. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And um, you know, Mike and I were talking about this, and he kind of reminded me. Mike Lentz is here with this. Uh, uh, it reminds me uh, what the 151st did uh, of that commercial. You might remember where there's like this is desert and there's all this smoke and you hear a helicopter come in. And the narrator says, when everybody else is falling back, we're going in, <laughs> running away from the trouble. We're going into it. Yeah. That's pretty much what the 151st was doing. Lee. Yeah. And when they moved forward, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, pretty much everything fell apart on Seminary Ridge around four. Right. So this is. So it's like a last ditch effort. Last now, ditch effort. Yeah. So there, and these guys, this is, is this their first major battle that they're seeing? You know, it is. Um, and yeah. that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. They were a ninth month, nine month unit, not a three year, like a lot of these units. Right. And there was a lot of controversy about that. A lot of the guys thought they had enlisted um, in September so that their enlistment would run out at the end of June. And the government said, well, no, your official enlistment is November. So you're not really due to leave until the 20, 27th of August. And, Somehow, I guess there was a compromise where the term of enlistment would end in July. But the point is, they were really within weeks right. of, of leaving. And um, uh, nobody really could have said a whole lot. Um, uh, but, you know, they're Pennsylvanians. And uh, the battle's going to be on Pennsylvania soil. So um, a lot of them were like, well, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's going to cost them. Yeah, um, big time. You know, Tim Smith um, wrote the forward to Mike's regimental history. And he talks about it, about why more people don't know about the 151st. And he made a good point. He said, um, you know, the only thing out there in Herbst Woods when you're on Reynolds Avenue is the death site marker Reynolds in the 151st Pennsylvania. Yeah. And everybody's paying attention to the death site marker for Reynolds. Right. So. Um, yeah, you're right. He's right. Because, I mean, and that monument's a pretty tall monument. It's not like it's mm-hmm. hard to miss. Mm-hmm. But no one cares. Everybody's focused on where Reynolds died. Right. Yeah. That's weird. But here's the thing. This this is the casualty totals. It's amazing. If you know Gettysburg, you know that the top number of casualties of any unit at Gettysburg, biggest battle is half the world, is 24th Michigan, mm-hmm. 363. They fight in the Herbst Woods just in front of the 151st. Does anybody know who numbers two, number two is in total casualties? No, I'm going to guess it's the 151st. <laughs> guess. <laughs> 337 out of 467 men, they're number yeah. two. Yeah. The top two Union regiments in the battle are in the Herbst Woods on day one. Right, right. And who are they fighting? 26, 26 North Carolina, North Carolina. Which has the highest number of casualties in any regiment in the war. Yeah. Hard fighting there. Yeah. Hard fighting. Yeah. Uh, and and so, uh, and, and McFarlane, I'm reading his speech, speech here in uh, Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, and he seems like a pretty good writer, but he just doesn't have that uh, panache that Chamberlain had. And that's probably why everybody thinks Chamberlain did all the hard fighting here. Yeah. Chamberlain's a college professor, and yeah. McFarlane is a. Regular old school teacher. Yeah. School teacher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, all right. So they're new, but uh, McFarland uh, uh, did, used, did, did target practice with them. That's right. Um, which I'm, I understand wasn't very common back then. And um, he actually got in trouble with General Reynolds for it. Um, I think it was back in Fredericksburg. Was, do you remember where it was? Somewhere like was that. it on the march? I was thinking I might have. That at some point he stopped them. Yep. Yep. And just to relieve the tension, he had them yep. practice firing. Yep. Which, right, was kind of unusual. Yeah. Oh, here it says, let's see. It was blah, blah, blah. He, uh, here, drill and picket duty continued with uh, such marked beneficial results that General Reynolds frequently complimented for good marksmanship and soldierly qualities. Oh, that's not the part I was looking for. But yeah. Um, so they're pretty good shots. Um, they have seen other battles. They just weren't under heavy fire. It was uh, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, I believe. They were both. They were yeah, at both of those, right? They were basically formed in the late part of '62. Lincoln had made um, a request uh, just about the time of uh, the Second Manassas Campaign for additional troops. I think it might be like six hundred thousand or something. And uh, the 151st was one of those units that answered that call. They were basically on outpost duty for quite a while just outside Washington. They were at Chancellorsville, and they got close to fire. Like a few of their guys were, you know, kind of 
close to some Confederate pickets, and they, they, there was fire, but it was nothing that um, you know amounted to any casualties or anything. So really, this really is their first battle. They're kind right. of like the 24th Michigan. You know, they were yeah. down there at Chancellorsville, but they really weren't engaged. Right. Um, <clears throat> so when they're moving out and they're engaged in the battle here, um, they're taking some pretty good casualties, but McFarland orders them not to fire in volleys, but to pick your target, right? Go ahead. I was just, well, it's just funny. I was just reading that before I came over. It's interesting <laughs> you saw that. Yeah, and apparently because of that target practice, it worked better for them. Yeah. Just to deliver a blind volley and hope you hit something, whereas these guys are individually picking out um, uh, enemy soldiers and were able to, able to hit them. So they are a lot more effective. Um, yeah. In, in his speech, he says, but our men coolly waited until they saw an exposed enemy and then brought him to the ground. Expressions like, there he goes, and I brought my man, etc., were heard and men loaded more cheerfully because another gun less was left to send its leaden hail into our exposed ranks. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about this is these guys are firing at close range. Yeah. Um, I think uh, at, at one point they were something like 50 to 100 yards from the enemy. Uh, 20 paces is used. So the Confederates are coming out of the Herbst Woods, and the 151st is right there where the woods kind of thin out on the eastern McPherson Ridge, just kind of waiting for them. And it's, it's you know, in the American Civil War, um, you don't see guys getting as close to each other like they did in the American Revolution because in the American Revolution, they're firing smoothbore muskets. So you're only killing somebody at 50 to 100 yards, where in the American Civil War with rifled weapons, you're killing people at three to 500 yards. Mm. So you don't tend to get that close. And there's it's kind of rare that they get this close. Like the wheat field, they got close because they're, you know, in a uh, compressed uh, area that's open. Uh, and uh, same thing here at the Herbst Woods. The 151st is just standing there waiting for these guys to come out of the woods, and they're like 20 paces away. So, you know, today you can go to the 151st Monument, and they've got flank markers. Mm -hmm. And you can take eighth graders, and you can line them up along that line. And I'll often do that. 20 big paces, and you're, you're just inside the, uh, uh, just outside the wood line, mm -hmm. you know, and say, look at this. This is how far they're, how close they are. Yeah. And so... Uh, at that distance, you you should be able to hit. You should be, yeah, especially if you're taking careful aim. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, about how long are they out there fighting for? Well, you know, everybody fell back and started to fall back from Seminary Ridge around 4 o'clock. Um, they had to have been out there at least a half an hour or so because I know uh, one of the things it said was that they were alone out there on their own yeah. and fired at in the flanks for 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. But everybody else has retreated. Now they're out there and they've hit, been hitting the flanks for like 15, 20 minutes. So that's what's amazing to me is these guys are out there and they're not facing one regiment. They're facing several regiments. Yeah. Yeah. Pettigrew's brigade, <laughs> brigade. basically. Yeah. Half of it anyhow. Right. 11th, what's North left Carolina, of it. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I would think that they would be swallowed up rather easily. But of course, I've never been in this type of situation. So what do I know? But so what, what is it well, that you, you know, think that makes them hold out for a half hour? Or well, you know, minutes? it's the condition of the North Carolinians, too. They've been fighting the Iron Brigade. So they've taken a lot of casualties. They're yeah. pretty exhausted. They're coming uphill through the woods. So I think that has something to do with it. I'm sure it has a lot to do with it. But you know, the, the 151st is stubborn. Uh, yeah. You know, they're fighting on home soil. Yeah. And they're inspired by that. And this sure. is the first time they've done that. So I think that had a lot to do with it, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so then they, they, they fall back. They fall back or they retreat? They withdraw? What, 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 is it an order or is it spontaneous? Um, I think Doubleday may have given the command at some point, and then McFarland gives a command for the unit to eventually fall back. And, and where they fell back to was just northwest of the Schmucker Hall. Okay. Um, and their entire, uh, they fall back to the rest of Biddle's Brigade. All right, yeah. Actually, wait, here, I think I might have found the uh, answer here. Receiving no orders to retire, I held my regiment in position until nearly every third man had fallen. Then, seeing no Union troops coming to our relief, uh, but that our right and center had fallen back, as well as the brigade on the left, I gave the order to retire firing. Okay, so he, so, might, so he did. He pretty much did it on his own. Yeah. Which is probably smart. <laughs> you thirty of your troops are gone, and you probably be like, maybe now's a good time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> save some of them there. Um, okay, so they go back to uh, Seminary Ridge now. There, it, he he says at one point that when they withdraw, um, there's um, the the Confederates don't pursue him; they stop because there there's a fresh brigade coming up, and they they allow them to pass. Right. What brigade is so that? in the Herbst Woods? 
when they move forward to cover everybody's retreat, they're fighting North, fighting North Carolinians. When they fall back to the seminary, that's right, another group comes up. Parent, it's Parents Brigade, South Afghan Carolinians. Poet. And uh, the main regiment that they're going to be fighting is the 14th South Carolina. So, uh, Powin's Brigade, you have to say it like that. Powin. Oh, yes. Abno Powin mm-hmm. is how you say his name. Uh, Perrin's Brigade, uh, do they do they engage them while they're still withdrawing? or? I think they engaged them while uh, the 151st had fallen back and was kind of standing along the seminary building. Okay, so they're already back at the, the new line, basically. Yeah, and at one point, uh, what happened was the... Uh, uh, the 151st noticed they were starting to get flanked on the left side of Schmucker Hall. So they kind of fall back to the north side to take shelter. Mm-hmm. And uh, McFarland, at one point, is just northwest of the building. And he's looking down, under, you know, c- trying to look under the smoke to the left to see where his unit is being flanked. And about that time, he takes a bullet through both ankles. Mm-hmm. That sounds And fun. he will end up being the last patient to leave the seminary building. Oh. Uh, two months later, in early September, he was the last patient. Oh, really? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting story about him. Can I... Go ahead. Can I divert a little Please bit? do. Um, you know, he was in a bed, supposedly, on the north... south, south eastern corner of the building. He was wounded on the northwestern corner, but he was recuperating in the southeastern corner of the building. And... Uh, all the doctors were apparently tending to all the other 600 so patients in the building. And uh, there was a, a pitcher of water on a chest of drawers across the room. And he's sitting upright with his back to the backboard. And there's nobody to help him. So he gets up and tries to hobble across the room to get water. A cannonball came into the room and lodged itself in the backboard that he was just leaning against. Oh, so by getting lucky. up to get the water, he saved himself. Yeah, man. And it, it's like, if he had said, oh, I'll get it later, it would have been over. Yeah, it would have been over. Right. Wouldn't have needed the water anymore. You never know. That's why every time you get an idea, do it right away. Yeah. <laughs> you might get a cannonball in your head if you don't. Stay hydrated. Yeah, and stay hydrated. Right? <laughs> Always stay hydrated. It might save your life in more ways than one. Um, all right. I got a question, though. So while the 151st is kind of out there, just swinging in the wind, uh, nobody back on uh, Seminary Ridge uh, sees them and says, hey, maybe we should reform and uh, go out there and protect their flanks and maybe try to push back uh, the Rebs. No. no the, 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 the Confederate numbers were just so great that, that um, you know, the rest of Biddle's brigade is, has no choice but to fall back in their <laughs> position. You know, really all they're doing is just trying to delay the Confederates long, you know, as, as long as possible. Yeah. Um, so they can make a retreat through town. So when they get back to Seminary Ridge, they're barely hanging on. Yeah, and I think this this has come up on uh, shows about something to do with the first day before. It's important to keep in mind that the intention probably was not to win a decisive battle out on the first day's battlefield. It was to delay so that uh, they can get to Cemetery Hill with a substantial force and also, I'm sure, weaken the Confederates as well. And give the rest of the Union Army the time they need to come up to and come occupy up. the fish yeah. hook position. And, you know, if you look at the battle in the latter stages, uh, the Union Army may have waited too long to leave the seminary grounds because as some of the artillery is going down the Chambersburg Road, there are Confederates up there among the seminary buildings shooting at the horses and, you know, taking out, oh, slowing yeah. down some of the guns, capturing some of the guns. That were, and uh, it got a little hairy in town. I yeah. You know, the 11th Corps was retreating from north of town. So these Union First Corps guys are, are coming in from the west. And all of a sudden, all these other guys are coming in on their left from the north. And they're running at each other. And uh, I've read that at, at some points, Union soldiers uh, covered the entire street from, from the stoop of one house to another. I mean, they were I completely blocking up the streets. Yeah. You know, and allowing the Confederates to come in and start to gather these guys up by this score as prisoners. Sure. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, a lot of the First Corps units, um, like Robinson's division, say, uh, they didn't come up through the town, correct? They took the path that uh, 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 Wadsworth's division took across lots, right? Not, yeah. not coming straight up the roads oh, through town. They're, they're coming through the Sheeds Woods south toward the um, Chambersburg Pike and then moving along where the railroad bed is today, kind of mm-hmm. toward the college. You know, and then when they get into the western edge of town, which is about where West Street is today, um, you know, trying to get through town the best way they can, you know, left here, right here, over a fence, that kind of thing. Yeah. So to go back the quickest and most direct way possible away from the danger that you see in front of you, they're probably not retracing their route. They're going by a completely new route. Correct. Uh, I mean, are we talking about the Union troops in general? In general. uh, The first corps, especially. 
Cause yeah. Right. Cause they're, they're, they're probably trying to go through the town. They're not going the way they came up and that's yeah, got to be confusing. Yeah. Because they, they came up the Emmitsburg road and turned at the Kadori farm right. and went across the open fields up to where the Schultz house is today at the corner of seminary Avenue and uh, middle street or Fairfield road. Yeah. So you're right. Now yeah. they're going, you know, directly into the town from the seminary and, and you're right. They have not them. seen these streets. You're right. right. And I mean, maybe even if you have seen the streets, still you've only seen them once, and now you're panicked. So maybe, maybe it wouldn't have helped anything. But still, they don't know where to go necessarily. And it's just uh, so much confusion. The streets of town, yeah, you know, because the the eleventh course coming in on your left, and you're not even sure where you're supposed to go. Cemetery Hill, south of town, and like I said, some of these guys were actually climbing over fences and backyards and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it must be like what what it's like when Bike Week uh, is going on. Good analogy. <laughs> Chaos and confusion. Chaos and, and a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah, a lot of noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't experienced that sometime, come and check it out. Yeah, yeah. for just a day. Um, all right, so the uh, so but okay. Now I skipped around there a little bit, but so let's get back to Seminary Ridge. So the fighting on Seminary uh, Ridge around the seminary itself. Um, what does the one fifty first go through there? Are they um, Beaten up more? Or are they given back, or what's going on with them? And, and when do well, they? I think retreat? they're making units like the 14th South Carolina Pay. Um, you know, there were like 34 Union cannons along the uh, ranged along Seminary Ridge. You can see a couple of them were the um, where uh, Mary Thompson's house is. If you're going up mm-hmm. 30 toward the town, you look over and you see those two cannons over there. Yep. So there's like 34 of them in the ridge, and they're they're making the Confederates pay a terrible price um, in uh, capturing Seminary Ridge and forcing the Union Army off of it. But uh, the 151st is Kind of in the middle of the seminary, like I said, they're they're kind of right where the Schmucker Hall is, and they're, you know, once they start to get flanked on their left, they're falling back and using the building itself mm-hmm. as shelter. But eventually, you know, the whole line gets overlapped to the south, and uh, everything falls back. Where do they fall back to? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, I know a lot of them talked about coming down um, like High Street, what is okay. High Street, um, and then getting to like Washington Street. And then turning right, they, they said there was a lot of congestion at the corner of like High and Washington Street. And, was it you know, road construction? Because I don't like it is today. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. They must have been working on the roads then too. But yeah, so go ahead. They make a right on Washington, and then make their way back to Cemetery Hill. Of course, once you get back to Cemetery Hill, you pretty much reach safety. There's about a four thousand man reserve left there by Howard earlier that day, and about forty three cannons posted up there. So once you get um, you know, south of where the Farnsworth house is today, uh, you, you pretty much reach safety. Do it, it, where did where did they end up being uh, assigned to after they? The first corps was put. They were chewed up so badly. The entire first corps lost like fifty percent of the men. You know, yeah. they ceased to exist. Yeah, like the third corps after the battle. Right. They were put. Um, kind of in the rear of Cemetery Hill. Uh, my guess is probably in the area where the Comfort Inn is today, kind of on the reverse slope uh, okay. down the Baltimore Pike in that low area, kind of where the cemetery is today. Some more as a reserve? Yeah. Okay. Because they were so chewed up. Yeah. You know, and the 11th Corps is up on top of Cemetery Hill, and the 2nd Corps is supporting them on the left, and then um, 12th Corps comes in and, and occupies Culp's Hill on the right. Right. Um so then the uh, the rest of the battle, do they see any action at all? Are they, are they, they do. called up? Okay. On the third day, they help repel Pickett's Charge. Okay, Amazing. there you go. Um, I don't know that they took any kind of serious casualties in that like they did on the first day. Um, but where they were, um, along with the 80th uh, New York uh, Biddle's Brigade, uh, is kind of between the Cops of Trees and the Pennsylvania Memorial, if you know okay. where it is. Yeah. Um, probably just north of where the... Uh, 13th Vermont with Stephen Brown, regimental marker is. Um, maybe opposite the Gibbon Wounding Tree, the, the Black Walnut, the Witness Tree, kind of to the right of okay, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. You go up the road, and the Black Walnut is um, the one that was damaged last year. Yeah. It's on your left, and then just kind of to the right of that, maybe just a little bit further up. Okay, you so... Can, like um, I don't think they have a monument there, but I think uh, the 80th New York may have one there. One of their sister. Yeah, that sounds familiar. The 80th New York being in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, so after the battle, so what? What are their total casualties by the end of the battle? Uh, the number I'm familiar with is 337 out of 467. Okay. So that comes out to, I wrote it down here somewhere, 72 uh, percent. Uh, casualties, yeah. How's that? God. They were, that was the ninth highest percentage casualties in the entire uh, Army of the Potomac in the battle. Uh, they were number one in wounded. 
out of 300 regiments, second in total casualties, only second to the 24th Michigan, okay. and sixth in total killed. Uh. So, you know, if you go to the Pennsylvania Memorial and you go around the corner to the left side, their regimental plate is the first one around the corner to the left, facing uh -huh. north. Yeah. And you look at it, and there are stars there for all the guys that were killed. And you look at all the other regiments, it's like looking at a starry night. I mean, it's just all kinds of stars. But here's the thing. They were first and wounded. And if they survived their wounds, there's no star. Okay. So what if they put the wounded on there? They were number one and wounded. What would it look like now? Right. You know, so. Well, yeah. So, I mean, that's a huge number to lose out of it, especially because, like, you know, your, your contract's almost up. You know, you, you made it through. You, you were there at Fredericksburg. You were there at Chancellorsville, but you didn't get into a lot of heavy fighting. You're lucky. And then here's Gettysburg. Yeah. Here comes Gettysburg, and you get torn to bits. Not fun. What happens to them after the Battle of Gettysburg? Um, they pretty much are done. Mustered out. Yeah. yeah. They're, uh, the next battle, of course, the next major battles are uh, in um, Northern Virginia in the fall, and then the really big battles come the following spring when Grant comes east, and the, uh, we go into the uh, Overland Campaign in the spring of '64. So they were nine month regiment, and they were pretty much at the end of their. Um, uh, term of enlistment, and they had so many casualties as it was now, there weren't that many guys left. Yeah. Um, and they just, as far as I know, uh, remained in the first corps in the pursuit of the Confederates, and by the time they um, uh, got back into Virginia, it was time for their en uh, en enlistment to run out. So, uh, do, do you know when their enlistment ended exactly? What date? Well, supposedly the date that the government set, because the guys in the unit were saying we should have been out by you know, late June uh, was the 27th of July. Okay. So that's pretty much the end of the Gettysburg campaign. Right, right. Um, and do we know, did uh, did they enlist in other units or did the, the survivors? Or did no, they I think they've been go? nine months. Yeah. So most of them are just gone. They're like, we're done. Kind of did their part. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. You know? I'll say. Um, all right. Is there anything else that you want to add that the audience should know before we go to our break? Yeah, I appreciate that, Matt. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about where they were from. Go for it. Um, they were from uh, the, the biggest the county that they came from was Berks County, Reading, Pennsylvania, South okay. Central Pennsylvania. Uh, four, over four companies, four and part of another company, uh, were all from Berks County. So almost half the regiment was from mm -hmm. Berks County. But they were also from Susquehanna County, which is northeastern Pennsylvania, Pike County, which is northeastern Pennsylvania, Warren County, which is west. Um, and then they had uh, some from Juniata, Snyder, and Perry County, which are just counties north of Harrisburg. Schuylkill. And Schuylkill County. That's the other one. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I used to live in Pike County. Pike County is nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. For a year. It's on the eastern, it, does it border? It's the where Delaware like River? New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania all meet. You mean up like Port Jervis, that area? Yeah. Yeah, I, I lived in uh, just outside of a town called Milford. I know where Milford is. Yeah. That's where your friends are from, near Matamoros. Yep, yep, yep. 84, right where it goes over the Delaware water. That's right? exactly right. Uh, yeah. I've been there. I, I, I was in a town called Dingman's Ferry. Oh, I know Dingman's Ferry. Uh, do you really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, it's, it's really nice up there. I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't stay there year round though, because winters are really depressing in the mountains. It gets so much darker earlier, and the wind whistling through those bald trees. Yuck! Nobody likes that. Well, I don't like that. But anyway, yeah, uh, it's a nice area nonetheless. So they, uh, so they're from all over the place. Um, and uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I threw, you, I interrupted you there. You had more. Oh. Um no. Are we done? No. <laughs> or are we just taking a break? Yeah, we were going to take a break, but okay. I, I wanted to give you uh, whatever else you wanted to cover there. You no, got, that's, you got that's where pretty from. much it. Okay. Um, I've got some quotations of, of uh, uh, McFarland and some other people that have observed what they did that I think are kind of neat. And, and Mike Drees mentioned some things. Well, go ahead. Give it, think, give it to us. Oh, you want to do it now? Yeah, do it now. Okay. Well, um, th this I thought was really interesting. Um, St. Clair Mulholland, who was the mm -hmm. commanding officer of the 116th Pennsylvania, um, he apparently wrote like a booklet about the Battle of Gettysburg. And um, he wrote a description of McFarland just before they went into the fight, the 151st. So they're taking cannon fire and there's bullets whizzing around. And uh, he says about McFarland, he said he, he was exceedingly calm and that in the midst uh, of the growing storm and while awaiting the infantry attack, he quietly sat on the ground taking notes. 
while the shells were flying in all directions. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to picture that, you know. I'm thinking, now that is a picture of a calm officer, right? Yeah. Taking I'll say. notes. Taking notes. You know, when the, when the bullets are flying around, not before the battle, well, before it really got involved, but still the, they're in the midst of the fight. So I thought I'd love to see what those notes are. A school teacher. Oh, yeah. 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 He's, he's, yeah. A, he's, such a, he's a teacher. He's just taking notes. He's just taking notes. Yeah, well, yeah. that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, Stratocumulus um, clouds. Uh. Kind of like Tom Hanks in Saving Private Ryan, the yeah. school teacher. From yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, Mike Dries, the author of the uh, 151st Pennsylvania at Gettysburg, said that uh, he thought that that kind of inspirational courage uh, really steeled the men. As they're watching McFarland <laughs> sitting there in the tree and they're taking notes, um, that it steeled them uh, for the, um, the ordeal which they were about to, um, um, to uh, encounter. Yeah, I would think that would work on me if I saw my my leader just calmly writing notes or you know doodling in a sketchbook or something. Yeah, so I either think he's insane or really calm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned earlier you said what you know what made these guys stand there and take this, and I guess one of the things was superior leadership. Uh, yeah, clearly McFarland was a great leader. Yeah, the men believed in him, and uh, so it's a it's a difficult moment. And, and he was all, right there with them. Uh, you right. Know? And not he a didn't lot of send the lieutenant colonel in. He's he's right there with him, yep. and uh, and he's encouraging them the whole time. And he he was on his horse too, wasn't he? He was mounted for a while until it got shot out from under him. Ah, yeah. look at that! Uh, Even Mike didn't Mike, remember Mike, at first. Yep. Yeah, Mike knows that that happened. So that's good. Yeah, because I didn't know. <laughs> right, he gets shot. His horse shot out from under him, and then he gets his own uh, ankles shot. Yeah. So he so now he's uh he's wounded in the both ankles or both legs or yeah, my understanding is the bullet went through both ankles. And I remember talking to Mike about this and he said that he never fully recovered the rest of his life from the wounds. Like he was on crutches the whole time. As a matter of fact, there's a picture of him in front of the monument the day they dedicated it. And McFarlane is standing on the north side of the monument, he's holding a crutch. And Mike even says in the picture, McFarlane can be identified by the guy holding the crutch <laughs> right at the moment. But um, one of the things I remember that Mike said, and this was years ago, he said um, throughout his life, these shattered pieces of bone from his ankles would like emerge. Come out. Yeah. yeah. And that he, he dealt with that the rest of his life. He was essentially crippled for the rest of his life because of those wounds. And, and what, how long did he live? I don't know. Do you know, Mike? 1891. 1891 is when he died. He had his right leg amputated just below the knee. Right leg amputated just below the knee. Keep going. And then he had his left ankle shattered. Ooh. And he lived with that for the rest of his life. (sighs) But here's a guy who didn't just sit in bed and wallow about it. Right. Like I would. This guy has an amazing life. What does he do? He actually starts a soldier's orphanage or soldier's orphan school. Okay. And so he runs that. He also runs a, like a, a tree farm, a Christmas tree farm at one. Oh. And his son it's becomes a very Pennsylvania in, thing to do. Becomes influential in the conservation movement, and some have credited his son as being the father of the National Park Service. That's Horace McFarland, right? Yes, Horace McFarland. Wasn't he involved in some kind of publishing or something oh, like yeah. that in Harrisburg? Oh yeah, and he had like a circulation initially of that newspaper of like three hundred, and through his exertions, even being crippled, he got it up to five thousand. Wow. So, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. There, a few years ago, there was a story about a guy who had an auto, like a tire dealership in Harrisburg, and this, uh, the hillside fell on his property, mm-hmm. and he's he can't get it fixed because they can't figure out who, you know what I'm talking about, Eric? And yeah. the, the building that was up above that, that was starting to deteriorate, or may have caused the, 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 the um, the collapse is called the McFarland Building. Yeah, and I, I I have a feeling that might be there. There, yeah, there was a printer in there before, um, and and it is called the McFarland Building. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what the hell? Where did you say that what was? Street is there? Harrisburg. It's in Harrisburg. Harrisburg. Yeah, it's it's right along um, Cameron. Cameron Street. Right okay. Cameron hey, street. <laughs> that's that is a major street to get Harrisburg. Huh. So he. Uh, Oh, I lost my. Oh, yeah. So no, you were saying. So he did all that, and, so, and then his son is the father, yeah, or uh, thought of as the father of the national. Right. Horace was. Horace, his name. I think Horace. that's the name. Is yep, it? Horace McFarland. Jay Horace McFarland. Jay Horace. Yeah, that sounds right. With all due respect to the Horaces in the audience, what a name! I would not want to have that name. What would they call you for short? Ho. Ho. <laughs> 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 I Howie, thinking. I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's better than what I was thinking. Uh, but this is a family show. <laughs> it's okay. 
<laughs> it just made me laugh the way you just came right out with it. You didn't even think for a second. You just went, hey, Joe, oh. home. <laughs> okay, so let's do. Let's take a break now. We'll come back with the questions from our uh, patrons and uh, hopefully some more uh, 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 jocularity. I think that was the word I was looking for. We'll be right back. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our subtlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary Building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717 717- 339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Brinkman is no stranger to Gettysburg, filmmaking, or this audience. An established Texas filmmaker, Bo has held the lead and supporting roles in television and film, including the 1993 film Gettysburg and its prequel Gods and Generals. Bo has written, produced, and directed several films, often drawing his characters and storylines from his ensemble of intricate comical and emotional family tales. The Last Mark, The Bay House, and Last Man Club are among his collection, with the latter winning Best of Show, Best of Picture, Best of Film, Best Narrative Feature, and Best Dramatic Feature. Now, 30 years after the release of Gettysburg, Bo returns to the same town for his next film, A Gettysburg Christmas, and he is looking forward to your assistance in bringing the film to life. Just go to GoFundMe.com and search for A Gettysburg Christmas or click the link in the show notes and choose your level of support. Hey, Gettysburg business owners, winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means, no tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio. It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached 1 million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at addressing Gettysburg.com. You're listening 
to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. And we're back. Uh, big controversy during the break uh, brought up by Eric, the producer, which I'd like to get into now because, uh, again, the school teacher regiment. Um, I know that there are a lot of people that like this regiment simply because it's called the school teacher, reg- school teacher regiment. But, Eric, while we were talking about it, you were doing some research. And what did you find, Eric? Eric Money, ladies and gentlemen, producer of Addressing Gettysburg. It's bullshit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why do you say that? So, uh, I, like, all this kind of stuff is f- relatively easily verifiable, mm-hmm. um, especially with Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania State Archives uh, are the ones that have the muster rolls and descriptive lists that exist for Pennsylvania regiments. And handily, uh, they have digitized most of them. Uh, it's not a terribly easy system to get through. Uh, some of it is... Uh, to be perfectly honest, a, a, a right pain in the ass. Um, I like some of them are are legitimately just digitally scanned microfish uh, films, like from back in the day when you had to go to the the library and sit behind this weird yep. computer looking thing. But it wasn't, but it wasn't it was a like, computer. It was like this, uh, like an overhead projector, but kind of in reverse. And, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like you turn the knob and it just like physically scrolls through. So yeah. it's like that, but um. I pulled the descriptive list, or what are they, yeah, the descriptive list, of ba- basically, uh, from May 63 uh, for the 151st PA, and I went through each company, because they have the occupations listed for every person in the company, uh-huh. uh, and I counted 19. 19 teachers! Now, my count might be off by one or two. Because you went to Catholic school, too. Well, no, because oh. some of them are illegible. Aha! So However, there could be more, but but no more there than could be, but not not a hundred and thirteen. <laughs> right. So maybe no more than twenty five. How many would you say would were ele- illegible? I would say at most twenty five total, to- including okay. the ones that I couldn't really read, but don't really look like they say teacher. Right. Okay. And so, and you were looking in in Mike Dries's book, and uh, when we were talking about this, and what did you find? Well. Mike quotes uh, McFarland, the colonel, the teacher. George took great pains to ascertain how many teachers were serving in the 151st. Following a detailed survey, he concluded that the regiment included 60 former educators. But I think what's really kind of pertinent, kind of dovetails, uh, segues in with what Eric's saying, is what uh, Mike wrote at the end of his appendix dealing with this. And the last thing he wrote was, the important point to remember is that bravery and self-sacrifice are not confined to any one occupation. Correct. Mm-hmm. At Gettysburg, each member of the 151st Pennsylvania, whether he was a farmer, a blacksmith, a shoemaker, a merchant, merchant, lawyer, politician, or teacher, faced death and or serious injury with courage and dignity for the cause he believed in. That's right. That's my case. Yeah. The, they're all brave and ballsy for just being able to stand there without pissing their pants and running away <laughs> like I would do. Uh, and and by the way, one of the I, I noticed uh, uh, occupations that you listed there, Eric, was artist. I don't know too many tough artists. Yeah, there's there's but one, there was one right there. Yeah, there's one artist listed in Company D. Yeah, you wouldn't see artists like that today. Well, maybe you would. Who knows? And what's interesting is mm-hmm. uh, like if you look at the breakdown, like the density per company, I, the company like that would have included McAllisterville, Company D from mm-hmm. Juniata County isn't even the highest density of teachers in the company. Right. And McAllisterville, I don't know if like we said this on the show. Yeah, the, the Why is that significant? The McAllisterville Academy where George McFarland was turning out teachers. Right. So, he, he, right. So it's, in other words, how, how many would you say were in that company? Do you remember off the top of your head? There are six. Six. Yeah. Six. Six. And they are, they are tied with Company E. For now, six. now I wonder: Has anybody? Do we know? Has anybody ever done this uh, research to find out is the number of teachers in that regiment more than you would find in any other regiment? Maybe in another regiment, the you know the average you, you know, of all the other regiments together would maybe be three, and so maybe comparatively, that's a lot. I mean, potentially, but but we don't know. Nobody knows this. Tw- 
20 out of almost a thousand. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not I mean, they really, lot. when you were listing all the occupations, they should call it the two farmer's percent. regiment or something. Right. The regiment. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, there if we go, folks. So, so in other words, like with everything else that we t- talk about here, the more you start to parse it, there's always that one question somebody asks that makes everybody go, hmm. And then you look into it and then you go, wait a second. And a good point that uh, either I can't remember if it was Mike or Eric or both of you brought up while we were talking during the break is that, uh, you know, McFarlane in his speech at the dedication of the monument says 113. And I go, well, where the hell did he get that number? Yeah. And Eric, I think it was Eric, he, he so uh, but properly uh, snapped back. Yeah. They all made shit up or something to that effect. And, uh, and he's like, look at Chamberlain. Look at Cha- what Chamberlain says and everything like that. So I think the, the thing that's so interesting about studying all this stuff is we want to have cut and dry, definitive answers on every question we have. And the more you learn about it, I find... The less I know, the less anybody knows, the the less there is to know. We have to kind of, it's almost like the Bible, right? Like you, you take the Bible, there's good lessons in the Bible, but can we verify that it's actually 100% historically accurate in every word? No, we can't. But the lessons are good. And I think that's really the way I approach this and the way I walk away from it is, whether it's 113 or 13, it doesn't matter. They got the name the school teacher regiment. Somehow this all came about. And to me, that's the interesting story. How did it come to be that we think of this as a school teacher regiment and Eric could only count 20 of them uh, on the muster rolls? So, like, that's. That's what's so interesting, and that's what keeps that little tingle going in my brain. Every time I think I'm getting bored with this, something like this comes up, and I go, oh, there's a new thing to get into. So I like that stuff. I have no evidence or data to back this up, but I suspect it has everything to do with George McFarland being in command of the regiment. I, I'm gonna he was get, the school teacher, right. and therefore it was the school teacher's so, apostrophe. See, as okay. Regiment. So that was what I asked during the break. Are we sure that he's not saying, or they're not, whoever the hell coined that term, Them. school teacher apostrophe S or S apostrophe, I, because that makes a difference. Yep. And if and if if somebody, if like, let's say, for example, I'm just making this up, McFarlane was going around and he goes, look at my beautiful boys, the school teacher's regiment. But we don't know where he put the apostrophe, you know, so who knows? Um... That makes it more interesting. But anyway, Eric, thank you for looking that up while we were talking before, because I think that made a, oh, an interesting conversation during I'm, the break. I'm and big on dissent. <laughs> I know, and that's what's good about it. It's you, you got to have that. I might, I might, because of course we recorded it during the break, so I might put that at the at the end of the show after the uh, theme song is over. Um, I have to go through and do some bleeping though. Eric gets very worked up over these things, and sometimes the curses flow like wine. So uh, I might have to go through for the sake of the the young years in the audience and bleep it. But I think it might be worth it because it's an interesting conversation. All right. So don't forget, <clears throat> these questions are submitted by some of our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. If you'd like to submit questions for our guides to answer and get exclusive content that takes a closer look at all things Gettysburg and Gettysburg related, please consider joining us on Patreon today. Our first question is Ethan Gallo. Gallo. And uh, he says, were they, the 151st, involved in any bayonet work during the battle? No, not that I'm aware of. Didn't get to that. Tim Dolan says, was McFarlane mounted during his regiment's stand near Herbst Woods? I know his horse was shot out from under him near the seminary after falling back, but I always wondered if he was mounted prior to that. (laughs) So uh, from what I read today, he was. Yeah, and um, you recall what, uh, St. Clair Mulholland said he saw him sitting by a tree taking notes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know where the horse is there. <laughs> Maybe it was dead by that point. Was that before well, or after be. they went in? It was just before they went in. No, so the horse was probably just tied to the tree. It could be. Yeah. Sitting by, I don't know. But yeah, no, I think I read before that he was mounted. And, and that actually, the reason why I'm certain of that Wait. is because, yeah. We're talking about on the first. Yeah. When would St. Clair well, Holland uh, have ever oh, seen Oh, I'm so glad you asked that, because when you mentioned that before, yeah. I'm like, wait, why would He's he have second witnessed course. this? Yeah, he wasn't, yeah, I wondered about that, too. But he wrote a book about it, so I don't know huh. where Mulholland got that. Well, he might have talked to people. Yeah. Could, he well, could have done yeah, that. I'm sure he did. I mean, is the book, 
uh, his, uh, like completely his eyewitness account or no apparently not apparently like you said he's with the 116th and they weren't around on the first no time. yeah exactly that's a good point Eric I should have said that before um, why uh, this is another one from Tim uh, why if the 151st was ordered by the chain of command to move forward to Herps Woods did they ever receive an order to retreat why did McFarland have to make the decision himself or why didn't they ever receive an order to retreat, I think is what he meant to say. <laughs> uh, That's because everybody's back at the seminary already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These guys are out there by themselves. Well, and I'm, ma- I'm imagining, though, that, you know, they're at the seminary. We think of, you know, standing on Seminary Ridge right now and looking out, and we can see where the 151st was, but there was smoke on that day. There was oh, yeah. a lot of smoke. Yep. And they pro- maybe they wouldn't have been able to see them so well right. to know what's going on. And they're licking their wounds, too. Yep. I mean, and, like, beyond that, everybody's got problems of their own. Exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, those guys are like way out there, man. They're doing whatever in the woods. I have at it. Yeah, yeah. We well, have shit to deal with over. Right. Here. In line with that, uh, in Mike's book, he says that the rest of Biddle's brigade, minus the one fifty first, <gasps> lost five hundred and sixty out of nine hundred officers and men. Yeah. The other three brigades, or the other three regiments, excuse me. They're busy. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah. They're licking their wounds, as you yeah. say. Yeah, and they're they're probably further fortifying uh, whatever earthworks or breastworks that are there. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, you're right. They feel, like Eric says, they they got their own shit to deal with. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to say it. Uh, Stephen Lunsford, host of what's the name of that podcast that you were on, Eric? The Civil War Regiments. The Civil War Regiments podcast. You're welcome, Stephen. Hey, guys, I'm sure you will most likely be discussing this, but what was the actual percentage of members of the regiment who were actually teachers? Okay, we did do that. As they were all volunteer soldiers, uh, soldiers, I'm assuming, uh, from many different backgrounds. When we speak of the school teacher's regiment, and he doesn't have an apostrophe in here at all, so that's a third way. (laughs) (laughs) That's a third way, just plural. Plural non possessed <laughs> it gives a visual that a group of 500 dudes armed with bifocal <laughs> bifocals wielding rulers and bad grades for rebels <laughs> advanced on that fateful July day. <laughs> Follow-up question. Given the catastrophic losses in the regiment just days before they were mustered out with a large percentage of killed and mortally wounded, what was the impact on their homes, families, and communities? Good question there, Jim. Uh, that's a real good question. Um I imagine it was like the impact on all families that had people in the Civil War. Um, yeah. No, this fa- these yeah. these families particularly enjoyed losing all those men. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's the, the main breadwinners. You know, they're gone. Um, so, it, you know, almost all the unit is, is casually, almost yeah. 72%, something like that. It had to be a huge... So, blow to, uh, of course, all those people back home. Um, and yeah, and, and uh, Stephen, I'm sorry we answered your question before I got to ask it, but it was, uh, it was something I, that was obviously on all of our minds here, and we, uh, we got into it during the break there, so forgive me. Mitchell Randall, who has uh, apparently a fondness for my eyebrows. Um, he says, Private Lyman Wilson carried Lieutenant Colonel McFarland back to the seminary for treatment of his wounds. He nearly gets shot in the process. Where's the process? Is that by the prostate? Does Private Wilson? <laughs> does Private Wilson's story end here? Did he ever receive a medal for his efforts under fire? Uh, I'll have to look it up. All right, Lyman Let's see what Wilson. Mike says here. Lyman Wilson. We're looking Lyman that Wilson up there, Mike. What do you think? Do you know anything about Lyman? Yeah. Of, well, yeah. Mike has him in here in the uh, index. Do, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll defer to Dries, who's the expert on this. There you go. Mike's deferring to Dries, who's the expert on this. I had a teacher in high school whose middle name was Lyman, and we used to make fun of him. Because at that time, Lyman to me was just what Sprite uses. It's a mixture of lime and lemon. And they call it Lyman. <laughs> oh, and they my were, God. <laughs> What is ha- what is I'm, I'm stalling for time while while Jim's looking up the answer. Yeah, I'm looking up the page. <laughs> I'm waiting for you guys to join me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> However, McFarland reported that the only man near him at the time uh, 
this is when he's heading back, was Private Lyman Wilson of Company F. Wilson scooped up his severely wounded commander and hastily made for the north end of the seminary. The 30-year-old private nearly paid the ultimate price for his brave act as a mini ball clipped off a button from McFarland's coat sleeve while the colonel's arm was draped around his neck. Miraculously, the pair safely reached the sanctuary of the large brick building. That's one reference. There's one other. Can you, believe, can you imagine that? that? That's close. <laughs> you know? Man. Let's see what they have to say about Lyman Wilson. Uh, after his severe wounding, George McFarlane was carried into the northwestern corner of the building. Building's first floor by Private Wilson, where he recalled, I lay on the floor in my blood. Somehow, George found the strength to scrawl a brief letter to his wife, blah, blah, blah. And that's the end of the references to Wilson. So apparently, no. Uh, maybe he should have got a medal, but I don't think he did. Yeah. Uh, all right. Terry Bungie, I believe, or Bungie. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. New name by me. Welcome, Terry. Thanks for uh, joining us here. He says, I would like to ask uh, that the since the 151st PA Regiment is nicknamed the School Teachers Regiment, what percentage of the regimental strength were actually school teachers? We, we already answered that one. And I've heard read uh, both below and above average uh, 50%. Um, also, that's a lot. Yeah. Also, is it true that Gettysburg was the regiment's first battle? They were at Chancellorsville, but they really weren't engaged, just like most of the first corps. Right. Um, and then fifty percent is way too high. We've already established that there. Um, you mean number of teachers? The number of teachers. Yeah, yeah, we have. That would be interesting, though. That would be interesting. Mike Kern says, My understanding is that prior to Gettysburg, nine months regiments were viewed in a negative light by their three-year counterparts. Did the actions of the 151st and those of other nine-month regiments during the battle do anything to change this view? Yes. Oh. Uh, Mike Treese mentions that in the book. Okay. That, uh, yeah, there was some suspicion about these guys that hadn't seen experience. But after Gettysburg, uh, they had certainly earned the respect of the other units. Uh, in terms of support. I mean, the, you know, 151st really did help the Iron Brigade get the heck out of <laughs> Dodge, you know, yeah. and save. The problem was the units ceases to exist, so. Yeah. Um, and most of those guys are not, I don't think, re-enlisting in other units. Uh, but how about now, so, but they're, they're not the only nine-month regiment in the no. Union Army at this point, so uh, a couple of other ones that are, uh, go ahead. 27th Connecticut. 27th Connecticut, Mikey. Also, all the 2nd of Vermont Brigade are nine-month men. Okay. The 153rd Pennsylvania and the 11th Corps nice. nine-month regiment. Yep. Yeah. So other ones that uh, did pretty well, handled themselves rather well. There's, there's not many by the time we get here. Because but most of them are most, mustered out. Yeah, most of them have already left the Army late May, early June. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you see such a huge dip between... Uh, the uh, the numbers in the Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville, and the numbers in the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And that could, this could be an episode onto itself: the nine month regiments sure. and what they did here at Gettysburg. Because that is a good idea. They, there's a lot of varied experiences there going on with those commands, and the same suspicions you see are: will they fight because they're being mustered out in maybe two or three weeks? Right. The same things that you see whispered about the 151st are being whispered about the standards men, about the 75 men in the 27th Connecticut. God knows why. They've had a bad enough service as it is. <laughs> and then the 153rd uh, PA. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, Jim, you want to add to that? It, it, it's getting a little bit off the topic, but, um, you know, if you look at the 11th Pennsylvania uh, monument and, and what they did, um, they enlisted originally for like three months. They enlist uh, April 61, and their enlistment runs out before the first major battle occurs in July. And it's a reflection of how everybody thought the war would be over very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll kick their butts and it's all over. And then you look at that monument to 11 Pennsylvania, you see they re-enlist. And when they re-enlist, they re-enlist for three years. These guys are sobered now. Yeah. After first, first bull run, they realize this is not going to end in 90 <laughs> days. Right. So we're, we're in it for the long haul. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, Wild Bill Etzcorn, Captain Wild Bill Etzcorn, by the time the show airs, Corporal Jacob Shore, Company B, Pike County, survived Gettysburg and the war. 
He eventually went to own, uh, went went on, I think is what he meant to say, to become famous for owning a stagecoach line and an ice house in Milford, Pennsylvania. Eventually, we were just talking about Milford. Eventually becoming mayor and finally passing away in 1921 from injuries of a farming accident. My question is how typical was it for the common soldier to resume life as uh, as normal post-war? I think it depends on whether you have all the equipment that you went into the war with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like McFarland yeah. himself, you know, for the rest of his life, he's essentially a cripple trying to make, you know, do the best he can. Um, you know, you look at the, some of the pictures of some of these guys in Mike's regimental history, a guy named Michael Link had a bullet go through one eye and the bridge of his nose come out the other side. Ooh. He said that uh, his one eye was just a, uh, a running mess and the other one was like hanging out the socket last thing he think he saw was a confederate flag and somebody leveling a rifle at him so he's he's blind the rest of his life completely uh, blind so um, yeah what can, and when there wasn't was there anything like what we call disability back then you know I don't think so I really don't yeah um, you just got your pension yeah I mean um, things like uh, PTSD you know they didn't even know what it no. was you know uh, it wasn't until what World War One that they come up with the term shell shot, but I'm yeah, certain, right. these guys are certainly suffering from that. <laughs> they have uh, to. They're just, you know, they just hadn't been enough experience with this kind of combat um, to deal with the the repercussions. He, I, I didn't realize here because um, it was at the bottom of my page, but I just scrolled up. He has more to the question. Solomon B. Brink, Company B, was killed on July 1st near the seminary. He is buried in Milford Seminary, uh, Cemetery. That's cool. I want to go there and see it now. How difficult was it to recover, remove, and reinter the dead at that time? I can make Gettysburg in three hours on interstates while speeding, so I can't imagine the logistics involved then. And finally, the 151st is a subject, so I... Uh, I so, uh, Bill, what the hell kind of writing is it? Finally, the 151st is a subject. It is. So I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> it is a subject. That is true. He's glad to say we talked about the 151st. I, 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 well, he is, yeah, but it's... <laughs> I, I should have said this, and I meant to say this in the beginning, is that th- this episode is dedicated to Bill because he has been asking me for uh, probably two years to do an episode on the 150. Oh, first. he's the one responsible. He's the one responsible, okay. yes. This is his uh, fault. <laughs> so anyway, the 151st is a subject, so I thank you for that. I also want to give my 100% endorsement of the bus tour with Jim. It was like listening to an episode of the show while driving the battlefield. So Jim, um, do you recall? Oh, Bill and Cindy took a, d- yes, a bus they, tour. Yes, they you. got on my double decker. That's right. That's right. I was at first. I was like, "What are you talking about?" And then I, they're, they're from your area. Yeah, great people. Yeah, fun no, they're people. Very yeah. fun people. And they've been very helpful to us here. And uh, and uh, we're putting together that. I think I told you on August twentieth, uh, we're doing a live show at the Farnsworth House. Wow. And uh, so cool. Bill and Cindy are are like the. The first and second in charge of uh, our little committee to uh, put that together. And it's great because I don't have as much of a headache as I usually do. There you go. So that's nice. Uh, So, yeah. So, okay. So his questions then. Reinterring. Can I talk about that? Go ahead. This one strikes close to home to me because um, uh, Mike in his book about the 151st talks a lot about the sister regiments. And the unit was right to their left or to the south of them on McPherson Ridge was the 142nd. Pennsylvania. And um, uh, there was a lieutenant in Company E of that unit named um, uh, Andrew Greg Tucker. Or, yeah. Um, and he was uh, a 19 year old graduate of the University at Lewisburg, which became Bucknell University, mm-hmm. alma mater. Mm-hmm. And he's buried in the same cemetery in Lewisburg that my family's buried in. Um, he was wounded pretty badly. Um, on McPherson Ridge, and another guy was wounded, and and Tucker gave his um, horse to another guy and remained in the fight, even though he was ordered to the rear. And then eventually he made it back to the seminary, but he was wounded pretty severely. And Mike talks about one of the guys in the 151st, I think it was, um, that was in the seminary hospital, and and he saw the day that they buried Tucker. They He said they, um, they took Tucker out of the seminary in a blanket, and uh, they were burying him in the garden. And Mike said something about uh, they saw Tucker's head uh, fall out of the end of the blanket. And, and he said, I hope it's not unmanly to say that a tear 
stole down my cheek when I saw his hair dragging along the, on the grave. But the point I'm getting at is uh, Tucker's family heard um, that he'd been wounded here, uh, 100 miles away from home. And um, there was, a, I believe, a professor from what is now Bucknell um, and some of the family, and they came down, probably down the river to Harrisburg, and then they probably tried to get a train or whatever they could over to, to Gettysburg. They, were gonna, they had heard he was wounded. They didn't know he died. They were going to take him back home in the wagon hmm. and nurse him back to health. And when they got here, they found he was dead. Hmm. So hmm. they were able, they had the wagon here, and they, they were able to recover his body. That's why he's not buried in the National Cemetery. Okay. But that's an exception. Sure. You know, most of these guys, now he was an officer, a lieutenant, but um, so many of these guys, they couldn't afford to have a body embalmed or packed in ice or anything like that. Um, yeah, that, that had to be a ghastly task to to come here and retrieve the putrid body of a loved one. You know, I mean, I mean it's got to be hard to do for a stranger, but this is somebody you knew in life intimately, yeah. and now you're you're you know collecting whatever is left of them. Um, it, it's got to be the most heartbreaking thing. But then, you know, we, we're so detached from death in the modern day. But, but death was all around them back then. Yeah, it's not just the, the war, but the diseases. The, yeah. And, I mean, I'm sure that doesn't make it easier to lose a loved one. Um, and it doesn't make it easier to, like, you know, oh, here, here's his arm, put it in the blanket, you know, when you go and get him three months after he died. Uh, but maybe it was a little old hat you know it was familiar to them to be to have to go and do that or so i don't know it's tough it the whole thing is tough i can remember reading about my own great great uncle in the 155th pennsylvania little round top and uh, one of their colleagues was killed in the battle up on little round top and he talked about in the um, regimental history about he and some other guys um you know taking the, the body somewhere probably in the backside of little round top and burying it they grabbed an artillery um crate a uh, piece of wood off of it and scribble the guy's name and unit on it mm. so that the family could recover the body. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times those guys didn't have time to do that kind of stuff. Like you guys said, they've got other things on their minds. Yeah. But you were really, really fortunate if not if you got killed, but if you did get killed, that your buddy would actually mark your grave. Um, you know, the 3,600 Union dead in the National Cemetery? Yeah. Only 1,000 are completely identified. Yeah. Where they yeah. have their name and unit and stuff. Right. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, that unknown section is huge. Yeah, like almost a 1,000 are completely unknown. We don't even know what state they're from. Right. Came Barron State Plot. No, right. That's, it's its own section. And then there's, there's what, two, two on the one side, two on the east side of the monument, and then I think another unknown section on the westish side of the monument. There's an arc. Yeah. Around the Soldiers National Monument. Right. That's what William Saunders wanted to do to make sure that no state had priority and location in the cemetery to any other state. And so there, the states arranged in a semicircle. At the beginning of the semicircle and at the end, along the pathway, are the completely unidentified. And they have the little square yeah. white markers with the numbers. And the numbers coordinate with files that the park has with information that they did get on the soldiers, hoping that maybe someday would identify them. Can you can you can you go and see those? You know, would, that's a great question. I would love to see those. I would what? too. That's a, that's those, a great question. Those to think files about that. that correspond with the numbers on the graves of the unknowns. Oh, I. I mean, I'm I, sure you can. I would think so. But have you but, ever seen? I guess no, you've never seen it. No, I've never seen them. I would I, love to I, see I, those. What, what what's in the files? So uh, the the Park Service has files, you know. So the unknown yeah, yeah, yeah. are numbered, right? They're not yeah, yeah. names, but they have files with whatever information they had, whatever right? they found on the body. Oh, you know, just I've, little notes of things that they found, I, hoping they could identify. I have that. You have it. Yeah. Oh, how'd you get it? I, I heard it was top book? secret. Oh, it's the book. It's already in a yeah, book. What I, book? What it book? It was originally. I, like the the files are going to include like. The notes, right? Yeah, but it was all published in the uh, oh the 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 committee report to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Okay, right. So the the Soldiers National Cemetery Committee report. Um, there's a revised one from '65, and I think another one in '66 or '67. But those include all those lists. Can you bring that in one time? I'd like to look at that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely not? No. No fucking way. <laughs> oh, oh now I got to beep I'll again. Bring it in. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring it in tomorrow. That'd be cool. Oh, no. We don't have it. Oh, no, we do. Uh, all right. So uh, that was it for the questions there. Did you? 
Were you going to, you look like you're about to say something else. Nope. Just oh, have okay. a couple things before. Go ahead. Okay. You know, we talked about the casualties of the 151st, and I think casualties are certainly a reflection of how uh, a unit is engaged and how bravely they fight. Um, the higher the number of the casualties, quite often, um, you know, the more courage perhaps that they exhibit. That's not always the case, but I think generally it is a reflection that they're fighting bravely. But um, I think it's important to talk about maybe the casualties of some of the guys that they were fighting, what they inflicted. Yeah, sure. And, you know, one of the major units that the 151st was facing, along with the 11th North Carolina, was the 26th North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they lost, I think, uh, from what I read, they, they came out of the fight. They had 800 men going in. Very large regiment, about mm -hmm. twice the size of a typical regiment. They came out with 216. <laughs> I think they lost like 550 on the first day, another 100 on, seen, yeah. on the third day during Pickett's Charge, because, you know, they get about as far as anybody does during Pickett's Charge. So, um, you know, they were taking it, but let's face it, they were they were dishing it out, too. Yeah. And the only other thing I have, Matt, is I just want to kind of to, uh, to close. Um, I've used this on tours. And my friend Mike Dries, who wrote this regimental history, did a great job. Um, I see he gave me a, a T-shirt, and it's a picture of, of the 151st in front of their monument um, on July 1st, 1888, 25 years to the day after the battle of dedicating the monument. And there's a quote from McFarland, and I've used this even on tours, and he said, uh, it's on the T-shirt that Mike gave me. It says, let us not forget to oppress and press upon all, especially the young, the great principles for which we fought and suffered. George McFarland, mm -hmm. July 1st, 1888. Nice. Um, that is a good way to end it. And I think that's what we're going to do. As Bill pointed out. Uh, Jim does give a great tour, so if you ever get on the uh, double-decker bus there or any bus, uh, do you do both uh, buses or just the double-deckers? Yeah, I do the enclosed, so you both do either from the one. tour center and the visitor center and the double-deckers. Most of those goes out of the tour center up on Baltimore, Yeah, the um, Cemetery Hill. I see now. you coming through the lot here and you wave yep. and everything like that, mm -hmm. and I think those people are getting a good tour. I well, just thank did, you. I just did one. Uh, I was hoping, actually, you were going to be the guide. Uh, I took my family on one on Saturday, um, but uh, the Blade, Eric Lindblade, was the guide, and uh, so the whole time um, he was downstairs doing the tour, and mm -hmm. I was throwing things at him from, <laughs> a, from up top just to throw him off, but he didn't uh, notice at all, so <laughs> he just kept <laughs> Focused. Yeah, it's very focused. It's like a laser. <clears throat> all right, so that's about it for us here, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks for submitting your questions. Jim, thank you very much. Mike, thank you for your input. Eric, thank you for your awesome contradictory uh, research there that helped clear the air <laughs> on everything, and uh, we'll talk to you all next time. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the Badge Maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S says, the Badge Maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts so stout have got us fame For suit is known from whence we came Wherever we go they dread the name Of Gary Owen and glory Instead of spot we'll drink down Ellen Page